Allison, it's an absolutely landmark uh, decision because there are thousands of litigants across the country bringing similar suits. This is the first time a uh, pharmaceutical company, and it's a big one, Johnson & Johnson and its subsidiary Janssen, has been held liable for damages caused by drug overdoses, which were caused, say, the state of uh, Oklahoma, by misleading advertising relating to OxyContin and other pain-killing medications. Paul, Johnson & Johnson is appealing, of course, and uh, according to the court documents, they provided 1% of the prescription opioids in Oklahoma. So why are they uh, shouldering the whole burden and how strong do you think their case on appeal is? Well, I think they do make a, a strong case here, but the judge in Oklahoma basically found that they had flooded the market through advertising uh, with opioids and that they, they led to possibly as many as 6,000 deaths in the state of Oklahoma. That was the claim that was made by uh, the attorney general's office. And a lot of people would say, well, why would that be, why would the state be damaged by drug overdoses as opposed to the individual family members? Well, the state has to fund medical care for people who overdose. And there are a variety of damages that the state of Oklahoma has endured. Um, defense attorneys said it's ridiculous to blame uh, Johnson & Johnson for all of these deaths. And the judge compromised, I think, and came down with a slightly lower damage award. One reason why Johnson & Johnson did this or it's happening to Johnson & Johnson is they're the only company that took it to trial. Other companies settled before a judge can wreak a verdict there. Elliot, I guess there are a couple questions here. Number one, why the drug company and not doctors? Doctors are the ones actually prescribing the medications. How come they're not part of this lawsuit? And then how does this become something bigger that potentially impacts the entire opioid crisis? Well, okay, so taking your second question first, there's another uh, massive case uh, coming in Cleveland, Ohio uh, this fall where you're talking about 2,000 cases are brought together, nation touching literally, I believe, every municipality in the United States. And so certainly this was just one trial, as you've touched on, but uh, there are so many more to come. And frankly, we're likely to see settlements now that you've seen mm -hmm. someone lose a trial. I, other future parties are going to have an incentive to settle, right? Now, as to why not doctors, this is exactly precisely the point that Johnson & Johnson tried to hide behind. They specifically had said, because these drugs are prescribed by trained professionals, we, you know, we, we shouldn't be held liable at all. Now, look, in some of these other trials, not just the drug companies, you know, retailers uh, and distributors are also being sued. So again, this was just one small uh, subset of what you're going to see. You're just going to see a lot of litigation uh, over the rest of this year and beyond. Um, so this isn't going away anytime soon. But Paul, do you think they make a good argument that really doctors are on the forefront of this and that they should be held as responsible? Well, they make the argument that the FDA uh, approved this drug as an effective pain-killing medication used for proper purposes and that the drugs are prescribed by physicians. So why should we, the pharmaceutical companies, be held responsible? However, if you look, for instance, to uh, an analogous situation, the tobacco litigation, you remember similar kinds of arguments were used for many years against the tobacco companies and they won. In the end, though, they lost big time for millions and billions of dollars. And I think that's what the big fear is here among major pharmaceutical companies. This is a precedent that they're going to get nailed, especially when they get in front of juries. This was a judge trial. And so the verdict was a little bit over $500 million. Watch what happens when a jury with a lot of sympathy for all of these families um, get, it, get their hands on this case. Monster verdicts down the road here. Which is why it may never get to a jury in some cases, because these companies may choose to settle. And we should note this case in Ohio, the huge federal case begins, what, in October. So it yes. all happens. And there are soon. cases pending in New York, I will tell you, that have been filed on behalf of counties uh, throughout New York State and unions and other entities that were damaged by these horrible opioid deaths and right. this epidemic. So joining us now is Sabrina Strong. She's an attorney for Johnson and Johnson. Ms. Strong, thank you so much for being here to respond to this. What is your response to this landmark ruling yesterday? We disagree with the decision. Uh, we have sympathy for those who suffer from substance abuse, but Johnson and Johnson did not cause the opioid abuse crisis. And the facts and the law do not support the decision. Well, the judge disagrees. The judge says that not only did you all contribute mightily 
to the crisis, at least in Oklahoma, that you did something so callous that it has to be held, it has to be punished. Here's what the judge said, quote, defendants used the phrase pseudo addiction to convince doctors that patients who exhibited signs of addiction, i.e. asking for higher and higher doses of opioids or returning to the doctor early before a prescription should have run out, were not actually suffering from addiction, but from the undertreatment of pain. And the solution, according to Johnson & Johnson's marketing, was to prescribe the patient more opioids. What's your response to that claim? Those are not the facts. The concept of pseudo-addiction is recognized to this day in the label for FDA-approved medications in this class. And the issue there is for doctors to look at their patients and make an individualized decision with their patients as to whether or not they need additional pain medication or there's something else going on. It's important to understand that these medications that the company manufactured are for people who suffer from chronic debilitating pain. And the way in which the company manufactured these medications and marketed them to doctors was extremely responsible. There are warnings on these medications, FDA approved warnings, and it is up to the doctor with their patients to make decisions about who is appropriate for these medications. And that's what the evidence at the trial showed, is that the company was, was extremely responsible in the way it manufactured and marketed these medicines in compliance with the FDA and DEA regulations. Well, that's obviously not what the judge concluded. I mean, according to the way the New York Times broke it down here, I'll just tell you what they said was so much more than just the manufacturing of these pills that Johnson & Johnson was responsible for. So they said that they had a broader role than just in their own sales. That Johnson & Johnson developed a poppy strain that when refined became a central ingredient for drugs like oxycodone uh, to be used. Johnson & Johnson was the top supplier of that base opioid. Okay, here's where we get to how it went further. The sales staff relentlessly promoted opioids generally, not just the company's own. In some 150,000 visits, to Oklahoma doctors. I mean, it, that, what, what it says is that it was a really reckless and irresponsible marketing plan that got the doctors to believe that this was sort of the answer. Those are not the facts that were presented at trial. Uh, not one doctor in Oklahoma was called to the stand to testify that he or she was misled by anything that the company said or did. And not one patient or family member testified about any abuse or misuse associated with the company's medications. The company manufactured two pain medications for patients who suffer from long-term debilitating pain, and the evidence is that those medications were rarely diverted, rarely abused, and amounted to less than 1% of all the opioid medications prescribed in Oklahoma. That's true throughout the country as well. So there is simply no basis for the finding that the company is responsible for the opioid abuse crisis, which is a serious yeah. public health crisis in the state of Oklahoma and the country. Yeah. But it involves diversion of prescription medications, criminal activity. It is also largely driven by illicit drugs that are coming in from outside the country, from countries like Mexico and yes, elsewhere. Yes, but Ms. Strong, the reason that the opioid crisis is often driven by illicit drugs is because first people get addicted to the painkillers. First they get addicted to the prescribed opioids, and when they can't get their hands on them anymore, they then have to divert to the heroin and the fentanyl that you're talking about. And so if you don't think that Johnson & Johnson played any role, how do you explain the 47,000 deaths a year from the opioid uh, scourge, from the scourge of the addiction. How do you explain what's happening in the country? It's a very complicated public health crisis, but it does not stem from Johnson & Johnson's medications. We have to remember, nobody disputes that these are important, essential medications that patients need. And the evidence is that the company marketed and manufactured them responsibly. And again, to the extent that diversion is an issue, 
These medications, we can't paint this with a broad brush. These medications manufactured by Johnson & Johnson were rarely diverted, rarely abused. This is the company that you want manufacturing these kinds of medications. You want a responsible company doing it. That's what the ev evidence demonstrated right. here. Right. And unfortunately, it's very easy to paint this with a broad brush, but yep. we need to look at the facts of the case. Okay. And those are consistent with the facts of the case. We know that you will be appealing this decision. Sabrina Strong, thank you very much for giving us Johnson & Johnson's side this morning.